I have a great show coming up for you tonight, everybody. I have the healing vet, Dr. Edward Bassingthwaite, joining us to have a chat about silent pain in our animals, amongst other things. Right after Dr. Edward, we have the viewer question, and tonight we're gonna to be talking to the whales. So don't go anywhere, get yourself comfortable. The animals television show is gonna start in just a moment. Welcome to the Animals Television Show, everyone. I'm your host, Romy Bueller, and I have a great guest joining me tonight. I'm gonna to be talking to the healing vet, Dr. Edward Bassingthwaite. Dr. Edward is a holistic vet, and he's the founder of the Whole Energy Body Balance Method, which is a profoundly healing body rock massage method for pets, horses, and people as well. More than 50% of the animals that Dr. Edward sees have soft tissue pain silent pain. Unlike humans who express their pain openly, animals very rarely show pain unless it's severe. And Dr. Edward's going to be talking to us a little bit about some of the things that you can look out for. Right after Dr. Edward, we have our viewer question. Now tonight our viewer was interested to hear more about the whale song. So we're going to be talking to the whales about that. First up though, let me introduce you to Dr. Edward Bassingthwaite. Welcome, Dr. Edward. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and to share some of your just amazing knowledge and experience with our viewers out there. Um, so thank you for joining me. Uh, I'd love for, for you just to start perhaps and talk to us a little bit about your journey into becoming a vet and a holistic vet and perhaps what the difference is between a regular conventional vet and a holistic vet, if you can. Okay, so um, I, I grew up on a cattle property in North Queensland, so I was started working with, around and with animals from a very early age. Um, particularly when I was younger, horses were my real passion. Uh, we, we lived on a, about 120 square miles, which is pretty huge, but average for the area where I grew up. And we did all our stock work on horseback, so we bred and trained and competed on, on, on horseback. So that was a very big part of my life in my early years. Um, in my teens, I got really interested in natural horsemanship because the methods used weren't terribly kind. To, they were quite brutal, a lot of the stuff that went on when I was a kid. Right. Um, so that was probably my sort of first time when I started to explore alternative ways of working with animals to, to what was the norm. Um, then I went and did veterinary science because I thought it would be a really good degree to take back, to take over the family property farm, which didn't end up happening, funnily enough. Right. Um, so I went to the University of Queensland and graduated in 1995 with a Bachelor of Veterinary Science, started working as a vet in mixed practice in Western Australia, and I was a very conventional vet when I first started off 
um, working as a vet. Worked in a mixed dairy, um, beef, small animal equine practice in Western Australia that was actually a diabolically awful place to work at. So I had a pretty tough time at the beginning of my veterinary career after about 18 months there, I pulled the plug on that job because that just wasn't a nice place to work. Mm. Bit of a problem in the profession, actually. There's a lot of poor working conditions in the veterinary profession. Right. Still, unfortunately. Um, then I, I did a bit of temporary work in Western Australia for a, a while before I came back to this side of the country. And while I was on a temporary job, I met a veterinarian called Dr. Tom Ahern who'd come to Geraldton from Perth to do some work with some horses. He was a horse vet and he was an innovative, more holistically minded sort of fellow who'd worked out a way to work with horses' necks in that he would um, anaesthetise the horse and then when the horse was down lying on its side, he would stretch and mobilise all the vertebrae in the neck. And he would take these horses that had a forelimb lameness that they had been nerve blocked, x-rayed, worked up multiple times, couldn't find a reason for it. He'd work on the necks and the lameness would go away. So there was coming from nerve root compression, misalignments, um, problems in the neck. And um, he had a bit of spare time, sat down with me for a couple of hours and we had a really lovely conversation that changed the whole course of my life because I immediately thought, well, dogs and cats have necks too and I hadn't been taught anything about any of this stuff at university and vets still really aren't taught anything much about about this kind of neck back and soft tissue pain issues that are, are my passion that I work with so I just started getting my hands on every animal that that I that came to see me and started feeling into their bodies more deeply with more intention to see if I could find out what was going on and I found pretty quickly that a lot of animals have a lot of um, pain and tension a little bit under the surface that I didn't get taught how to feel for effectively or assess for effectively at university and vets still don't get taught how to feel for and assess for that effectively. I came back home to the family property for a little while and then went overseas and worked in the UK as a temporary vet, locum vet all around the place and after about 18 months in the UK I got really, really unwell with chronic fatigue syndrome. I was down to about 45 kilograms, had a Ooh. range of really awful symptoms of fatigue and pain and um, gastric ulceration and depression and a whole lot of stuff. So I had to come home and I couldn't work for a few years. I was too unwell to work at all. Um, Western medicine helped me a little bit in the beginning. Western medicine ran out of answers very quickly. Yes. And um, that led me to start exploring a whole lot of alternative and holistic things for myself to see if I could get myself well, including energy healing, which I found actually did relieve symptoms in a way that Western medicine wasn't able to. So that's when I really started to move into the energy healing side of things and found that animals are very sensitive to it, respond to it very well. And I've been integrating more and more holistic principles and treatments and medicines into my practice ever since then um, some years after that probably about I don't know 16 years ago then I started up my first home visit practice in Townsville and that that's when I could really start to integrate holistic medicine into my work because when I was working at veterinary hospitals a lot of veterinary hospitals are not very open to more holistic stuff at all um, but when I had my own business, then I could start to really explore that more. Um, about After about three or four years, I, I started to look at vaccination in animals and realised that um, our domestic pets are terribly over-vaccinated. Um, the, the core vaccines all last at least five to seven years, and most animals are being re-vaccinated every one to three years, which causes harm to a lot of animals. So at that point, I, I stopped re, just blindly revaccinating, started teeter testing. A little bit after that, we moved to northern New South Wales, which was a much more open-minded place than where I was before, which is Townsville, which is a, a garrison town and not terribly open to alternative and holistic things. Yes. That's when the Healing Vet brand came to life. 
And that's when I started to really um, move more and more into the whole energy body balance work, which is the, the healing body work modality for pets that I've created. And I started teaching whole energy body balance about eight or nine years ago when we moved there and um, was doing in-person face-to-face workshops for a few, quite a few years. Then 2019, we took those trainings online and um, we've now got about 1,700 people that have enrolled in that in those programs. We've got practitioners in Australia and New Zealand and, and America and the UK and some four certified teachers as well. So it's been quite a journey. Yes, I can imagine. And none of those things are uh, quick to put together, are they? I, um, I attended one of your COVID trainings online uh, yep. last year, I think it was, and, and I've done a lot of energy healing training um, for people mostly, but uh, it's certainly not like anything I have experienced before. It was, was absolutely a, a, one of the most fabulous things that I've done. So thank you for that from me. Um, no you talk a lot about silent pain, Dr. Edward, and I'm wondering what um, what is it that we're missing that we as pet owners or, you know, horse managers or caretakers or whatever what are we missing that we're not seeing an animal is in pain well about a little bit over 50 percent a little bit more than half of the people who come to me as a veterinarian with their pets i feel into their pet's body and i find pain silent pain soft tissue pain or more specifically neurofascial pain and when i tell these people they go what because I don't know, right? And it's, yeah. um, I think there's a couple of reasons for it. One, one is that people think that their animals will always show them when they have pain. That that simply isn't true. There's a, a really huge turning point for me was when I missed really severe neck pain in my own little dog, Mitzi, and he had taken a fall on the steps. I was married at the time. My wife actually saw him take the fall, but the little fellow just got up, shook himself off and seemed totally fine. So she didn't think to tell me. Fast forward three weeks later, I took him to a workshop. He was more reactive than usual with other dogs. When I got home that night, I fell into his neck and he's like, oh, agony, really, really painful neck. Now, you know, I'd been graduated 19 years then and probably 16 years of that time had had a really strong focus on helping animals with with silent pain, neck pain, back pain, body pain. And I couldn't see it, even though I've, I'm very skilled at picking up things and very good at observing animals. And that's where I realised, okay, there's, there's, there's a real issue here because before that time I thought what a lot of pet owners think is that, you know, I'll, I'll be able to look at my animal and tell when they've got pain. Now, if they've got acute pain, that is true because with acute pain, the pain level shoots up quickly from an injury and you get a change in behavior because of that sudden change in pain levels that nearly always is very easy to see. But soft tissue pain, silent pain builds up really slowly, little by little by little, gathers in the body over time. And it happens so slowly that it's outside the perceptual ability of the human to actually see the changes. You know, sometimes, yeah. I'll, sometimes I'll have an animal that I've, been seeing over the years and they'll come back um, from one year to the next and I'll say oh it looks like they've slowed down and got a little bit stiff and the person go really I hadn't noticed and that's because it's happened so slowly over that year it's just like normal for the person who's living yeah. with the animal. Um, yeah. I think another reason that this problem is often missed is that silent pain which is soft tissue pain or neurofascial pain is totally invisible to our diagnostic imaging machines, X-ray, CT scans, MRI scans, ultrasound scans. Of course, yes. So they, they can visualise these tissues. They can't see the pain. There's nothing that shows on the imaging to tell that the animal's got a problem. Is there, is there anything that you would suggest for, you know, just the lay person to look out for or, you know, to to observe in their animals? And, and are we talking mostly dogs and cats or is this is it the same kind of um, behaviour from all animals? Look, this is true for all, all animals and, and humans too. You know, when you walk down the street with a whole lot of people, there'll be a significant number of people on that street that have chronic pain, but when you just look at them, you won't know. 
right? People don't actually show pain either, but they can tell you when they have pain. Yes. But um, there's, there's some red flags to look out for. So the first sort of thing to look out for is any unexplained change in behaviour. Even really small changes in behaviour can be a sign of a, a very large pain issue. So Mitzi's little change in behaviour alerted me to the fact something was going on. But actually, during the three weeks before that, he'd had another little change in behaviour, which was that he didn't want to go up the steps anymore. Right. Now, at the time, and fair enough, he'd had a horrible, painful fall on the steps. No wonder he didn't want to go back up the steps anymore. But at the time, I just thought he was being a funny little guy because he is a funny little guy. <laughs> right? But yeah. now, if my dogs show a little change in behaviour like that, I'd say, come here, I need to get my hands on you. I need to feel into your body and find out what's going on. Because the, the only way to, to accurately know what's going on with soft tissue pain, silent pain status with your animals is learn how to feel into their body and assess for it with your own two hands. But changes in behaviour, um, um, another change to look out for behaviour is if your animal's play behaviour reduces or stops. That's often a pretty strong sign that there's something not, not going well in their body. If there's any, any increase in reactivity and aggression, that's often driven by pain and fear of being hurt. Another behaviour that a lot of people don't think anything of is that people often come in and say, I'll say, is there anything else you need to tell me about your animal? And they say, oh, yeah, it's funny. They don't want to jump on the couch anymore. And there's not a dog in the world who doesn't want to jump on the couch, right? Yeah, they love yeah. Being on the couch, and when I when I then feel into these animals' bodies, I nearly always find that they've got significant back pain that's preventing them from jumping on the couch. Now, a second sort of category of things to look for is how your dog moves and holds their body. Again, any changes in that are cause for concern, particularly if there's any stiffness or slowness in your animal getting up from lying down, especially if they've been resting for a while. Any change in gait or how they hold their body one way or the other, even if it's really, really subtle, can be an indicator. And another really important one with that is how your dog shakes tells you a lot about their pain levels. If your dog's got anything less than a really vigorous wave of shaking from head right through to tail, I can just about guarantee that I'll find pain in the soft tissues in the body. Right. You see some of these dogs just shake their head a little bit and that's it. Yeah. The other ones will shake their head strongly and then it'll taper out and hardly shake any other second half of their body. But the third thing to look out for is, is a big fat nothing because you'll get a lot of dogs that won't even show these, these red flags. They just simply don't show anything that you can see and it's not until you feel into their body, connect with the pain and tension in their body and read their responses to that that you can go, oh, this is what's going on. And do you think that some of that is not wanting to, you know, if you come into, say, the the emotional side of the animal, um, not wanting to concern their mum and dad, their human mum and dad? I don't think so. I think there's some really strong instincts in animals to hide pain, which go back to survival instincts from the wild. Yeah. You know, okay. if... Um, Nearly even though dogs and cats are predators, they're also prey for larger predators. Yeah. And if they show weakness, then it's like the predator goes, oh, that Target. looks like lunch. That yeah. Like yeah. Lunch. Yes. And in wild dog packs, in some kinds of dog packs, if one dog in the pack is injured or weak, the other dogs can turn on it and kill it too. So there's some really deep instincts in all animals, to hide weakness and pain. Yeah, um, another that makes thing, sense, that, that hard wiring, isn't it, that yeah. innateness. And another thing to consider with that is that um, humans vocalise pain and discomfort. We make a noise. We're very, we're very vocal about yeah. that. And animals hardly ever vocalise pain. So humans, because we think every other animal in the world is just like us, we assume that this the animals that we're interacting with are going to vocalise like us when they're in pain. And animals will not vocalise unless pain is really, really severe in nearly all cases. Yeah, right. 
So what would you, um, you know, because obviously with everything, people as well, prevention is better than cure and, and a maintenance program. Uh, you know, there's probably animals out there s- struggling with the, the silent pain to start with. But if you were to see someone with your cat, dog, horse, um, what would you then do to continue with that maintenance? Would that be a, a weekly thing or a monthly thing that you would suggest that, you know, that you would do with them? Well, when one, the, the sort of main treatment that I find to be really effective is the hands-on work, the whole energy body balance method, which I've developed to, you know, mostly because I see, I've see i seen so many animals with pain over the years. Um, an initial series of treatments might be anything from three to nine sessions, depending on how young or old the animal is, how severe the problem is, um and then maintenance probably about monthly is good but i really encourage people to learn how to do this for themselves you know i still miss pain all the time in my dogs and cats mm. i get my hands on them every week and i often find that they they've got pain that i didn't know was there and that they really appreciate me gently melting that pain out of their body with the loving touch of the web work yes and and that's a good point you know the the um the program, the method that you teach is not just for people that are wanting to practice this as a business. Uh, so this is for anyone, isn't it, that can that has yeah. an animal that is, or is even just interested um, to do something with this. I know this is probably very difficult to describe in a in a few sentences or whatever, but can you share with um, the viewers a little bit what is that? Can you can you sum up what the web Um, method is what would they be looking at so it's a profoundly in in a nutshell it's a profoundly healing combination of body work and energy work or energy healing but to expand on that a little bit um it's a comp if we just talk about the web body work for pets which is the real core of the work i think that's what people most need to learn it's a whole big toolkit of hands-on skills ranging from assessment so that you can feel into the body and work, map out what's going on in terms of pain and tension in the body. And then there's a whole big toolbox of different hands-on bodywork skills that range from really gentle, subtle work like craniosacral and very light touch through to really deep release and and mobilization work of the core structures and tissues of the body. And it's not just um, working on the animals, it's working with them. So there's also, we teach you how to talk dog or talk cat to a a whole new level so that you can be very sensitive to every little change in the animal's expression every little change in the animal's body as you're connecting so that you can be really responsive. So if you, you know, when you're moving through the body, sometimes you'll hit a spot that's 10 times more painful than everywhere else. And you won't know until you connect with it. An animal might go, Oh, that hurts. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to then just instantly relax the pressure, do some really gentle, apologizing, loving touch, <laughs> and then reconnect calibrating the pressure until you see the animal go, oh, I can feel that, but I can stay with it. You know, it's not too much for me. So there's a real element of understanding and communicating with your animals in a whole new way too. How do you go about um, working with an animal that is in, well, perhaps in a lot of pain, but also quite aggressive, even if they're your own dog, that just, you know, the dogs that don't want to be touched or cat or horse or whichever animal it is, um, are there ways that you teach within that in that program that you can work with dogs that are just like don't get off me, don't touch, from a remote point of view that can just perhaps realign their energy enough that they're less fearful or angry or aggressive to then be able to get the hands on? It's pretty rare to have a dog that's angry. They're nearly always fearful. I have met, yes. you know, in all my 20 five odd years of working as a vet I probably only met less than five dogs that I thought were really actually seriously dangerous dogs right 
as in dogs that would bite hard and without remorse and without regret sort of dogs, you know, the yeah. ones that give you the cold, hard, still mm. look and all the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you back yeah. away slow, you know. <laughs> um, that being said, with dogs that are painful and fearful, nearly always you can work with them. I do meet the, the very rare dog that can't tolerate touch and body work. I don't know if they're autistic or what, but I've, I've <laughs> met a small, small handful of dogs that just can't cope with it. It's, I've tried to do two or three or four sessions and it's just become evident, evident that, nah, we, we, this dog's just not going not gonna to allow me to work. But it's if you learn how to communicate better with the dog, if you learn how to have clear boundaries and you can be really responsive to the dog, you can work with most dogs even if they are potentially aggressive. The other thing that we teach our students is how to position yourself to be safe so you're always in behind the dog with the right. body with pointed right away, your hands right on the body and you can move you know, never get yourself into a position where you can't easily and quickly move out of the dog's space if, if you do hit a tender spot and they decide, you know, and dogs nearly always will do an air snap rather than really try to bite you. Yes. It's kind of rare to have a dog that will really bite hard straight up, but not impossible. I've had a few that have had a pretty good go at taking my hand off over the years. <laughs> That's why you've got two, just in case. <laughs> well, I've never touched wood being bitten on the job. I've come close a couple of times. If you're going to work with a dog like that, you know, if if you've got a rescue dog that's got major trauma, you might have to train them to accept a muzzle before you can work with them safely too. And I will definitely use a muzzle. You know, I work with a blue cattle dog um, this year quite a bit. And... The first few sessions, we had a muzzle on him because he would bite. He, he's bitten people. We know that he would bite. And if you've got an animal that has broken the skin on anyone, then, you know, I always, I might be able to get away with working with that dog, but a lot of people wouldn't. So I always encourage yes. people to just do whatever makes you feel safe. And if that involves putting a muzzle or sometimes an Elizabethan collar is another really yeah. good way to work safely with a dog yeah. because... They can't come through the collar to you, so that can give you quite a bit more safety as well. It's a little bit less, a uh, little bit more acceptable to some dogs than a than a muzzle, an e collar. I mean, they don't like it, but they can't scratch it off and stuff like a muzzle. Another thing that I'll use for dogs that are that are a little bit potentially dangerous is I'll tend to put a gentle leader on them, so you've got the the part of the head oh, yes. going over the nose as well and that gives me a lot more control over being able to direct the head than if you've just got it by the collar they've got way more freedom of movement if you've got them by the you know something that's restraining their nose as well you can often work a lot more safely with that if you know what you're doing yes yes and you know some of these things too are probably um uh, perhaps for the the human side who may be a little bit anxious um yeah working with their dog or their neighbor's dog or whoever they're working on so you know that sort of works for the animal as well as you know the fear of the animal or anxiety of the person um, so that's they're really good tips a little bit left of center dr mm -hmm. edward just um i'm going to have all of your information here too for everybody that wants uh to investigate dr edwards uh, trainings i'll have all the websites and the details so please check that out because i highly recommend that you do uh, so many animals uh here that that really need to get your hands on to um yeah. just a, a slightly different question because i don't know why it's come to my attention in the last couple of days i think people have been talking about this to me but you know this high level of um suicide amongst the vet and i believe it's the female vets um, mostly uh, although oh, no. i don't have no 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 there's there's plenty of male i mean there's a very large majority of vets graduating these days are women but um suicide is just as much a problem in the male side of the profession as the female side what do you do as a vet you know from your experience and for what you've seen because it must be very difficult uh for for you 
uh, being a vet in so many different ways. What what are the difficulties that you find being a vet? And then how do you sort of navigate the emotions of that to stay, you know, in a emotionally sound, I guess, yourself? Well, um, when I started off working as a vet, um, you know, I grew up out in a cattle property and the only time you'd stop work is if you were nearly dead. If you were injured, you know, you'd work through the injuries or whatever. I remember having pretty significant injuries and being back on a horse a day or two later, right? Um, so there wasn't, I wasn't taught how to to be kind for and to care for myself, which is more of a problem for men in general than women. Women are generally a lot better at self-care than men. Our culture doesn't really support men um, caring for themselves in that way. But with the veterinary profession, there's there's a few things I, that are at the root of the problem. One is that a lot of veterinary workplaces still are very poor places to work in, in terms of underpaid, overworked, mm -hmm. no support. Um, you're still getting, you know, occasionally on the, the vet, uh, vet groups that I'm on on Facebook, I still see stories of, of new graduates who are being thrown out into practice with no support, sole charge, just left to sink or swim, right? And that's pretty stressful. That happened to me. I know I know how stressful that is. Yes, yes. Um, then you, you lose animals as a vet. You can't save them all, and that can lead to extreme emotional distress. We have to euthanise animals as vets. A lot of vets find that tremendously emotionally difficult and mm -hmm. I think the other big factor with vets is that vets have easy access to euthanasia drugs and they can hook themselves up to a drip line and pop off, pop themselves off to sleep really quite easily. It's, there's a real accessibility issue in terms of a mechanism to, yes. to step out. Um, for me, I suppose um, me getting really sick in a way, was because I'd pushed myself so hard without listening to my body too, right? So I had worked in really high-pressure, high-stress veterinary jobs. My first um, long-term locum job in the UK, we had five minutes for each consult appointment. Right. Um, some days... That's practical. You know, it wasn't, wasn't unheard of for the reception to book two or even three animals into that five minutes of time for you to see with the person. We'd have three vets consulting there and on the some days one of the vets would get called out to a carving and then the other two vets would have to cover that. And, you know, I remember one day that I was, both the other vets got called out to a carving and I've got a waiting room full of, I don't know, dozens and dozens of people and animals to try and get through. So that, looking back, wasn't very healthy and I know that... Um, I had some pretty unhealthy habits in terms of I would go and binge drink on the weekends to try and discharge all that pressure. And I think that me getting really sick in a way was a reaction of my body to, to overwork and overstress. So then I had a long time of being really chronically unwell where I could not work in a hospital. I've only gone back to work in a veterinary hospital in the last six months, a day and a half a week. And I'm actually coping with that, but um, a year or two ago, I would not have been able to do that. There's right. no way that I would have been fit or well or strong enough to do that. So I think in the profession, I think there's a couple of things that are really important. One is you've got to have a life outside of being a vet. You've got to have some sort of creative or recreational passion that you can go off and have, have fun with. And I've got a range of things with that. You know, I do music, I do visual art, I like hiking and kayaking, and I like gardening. So I've got a whole broad range of different things that I do outside of being a vet. I think part of the trouble with the suicide issue in the profession is that people identify so completely as being a vet that they don't realise that they're a human being as well and that they can have a life apart yes. from being a vet. And then when you're in a bad job, you've been on call, so you worked all day, then you've been on call all night, you've got a front up back at work again, nine o'clock the next morning, and then you have a bad run of animals dying on you or whatever. 
you you're fatigued you're overworked you're stressed and you don't have anything outside of that to give you any sort of contrast or any sense of self outside of work i think that's a big part of the problem yeah yes it's it's a tricky one isn't it and and i think um you know i know there's always a lot of conversations about how expensive uh-huh. it is for the client and so the client kind of adds to that i guess with either yes getting angry yes. or not paying or, you know, having a go at the vet for their charges and things like that. So yes. I don't so, I think there's a lack of understanding from the pet parents or the, the animal caretakers yes. as to the costs and how that kind of works. There's a vet in Melbourne earlier this year took her life after being harassed and abused by a, a client, you know, and maybe that was just the icing on the cake of all the other issues that I've been talking about. Now, in Australia, people complain about how expensive veterinary care is. Well, um, if we took Medicare away from people, they'd be thinking veterinary care was suddenly very affordable because really the work that we do as vets, we're all undercharging for it, in my opinion. It should be way more expensive so that the vets can get paid a decent wage. I mean, we're the lowest paid profession. In, in, out of all the degree professions in Australia, you know, vets who have been out 10, 20 years uh, might earn $55 hour, dollars an hour, maybe up to 66 something like that, which is not, you, you know, tradies earn a lot more, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think, and the, there's some problems with the veterinary award too. The veterinary award needs to be rewritten and all of the veterinary... Um, and vet nurse to uh, salaries need to be need to be better paid. And to do that, well, veterinary care would actually become even more expensive, right? And people would complain even more. But um, yeah, people people are funny about that. Yes, yeah, it's and you do an extraordinary job. So it's we can't do without you. Um, I had a friend who was working in the sexual assault unit at a hospital in Sydney years and years ago. And they were, it was one centre that was on 24-hour call seven days a week. And those social workers had counselling every Tuesday for themselves um, so they could, you know, stay emotionally stable and their mental health um, was kind of managed. And, you know, I just wonder whether um, there's so many different professions. Um, We're talking vets, obviously, at the moment, but whether there's some kind of service that would be useful for you know, well, there's, there's a lot of emergency helplines and stuff like that that are open to anyone. Yes. And, if you, you know, the, the veterinary profession is is grappling with all of these, these problems. And, well, they have been for a while. I think another part of the problem is that the, the people that run the professional association, the Australian Veterinary Association, are pretty much all successful practice owners and managers, right? And they don't necessarily want to pay their staff more money. No. So you run into systemic other problems as well with all that sort of stuff. Yes, yes. On a lighter note, (laughs) let's lift the energy a little bit. Um, Do you work at all with exotic animals and uh, what is what is that even? But let's say snakes and you know different types of animals. Do it, do how do they exhibit pain? Well, um, all vertebrates are going to have the same sort of silent pain issues. So reptiles can absolutely have the same sort of issues. You know, most snakes are kept in enclosures where they can't actually stretch their body out straight. Um, yes. Most snakes that are kept in, in little boxes where they have to sort of be curled up, they can't actually move and stretch their bodies the way they should. So that, of course, is going to end up in pain and tension over time. But it's it's the same sort of thing, um, though I'm not so well versed in picking up subtle signs from snakes <laughs> and reptiles because I hardly work with them. Um, I mean, I don't really see exotic pets. They're, they're a different kettle of fish and I don't have the expertise that's needed to care for them. So I send them off to the, the special pets vet, which we, is now around Australia. I think they've got four or five different clinics in major cities around Australia. Um, the unusual pet vet or something like that. Yes, so there is a, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. So, um, but that being said, um, you can do body work on reptiles and snakes as well, and it will help them feel better. You know, you don't sort of think too much. I mean, you can intellectually, you can imagine that a snake just in a box that's <clears> kind of, you know, never going to go so well, but the, the actual stretching out of their body and, and uncurling, yeah. not being able to do that, that'd be like being in jail. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine that wouldn't feel very good. Dr. Edward, with horses, what I find a lot um, as a, doing animal communication, uh, and I do a lot of um, work with horses and cats and dogs, they're kind of my three, I guess mm -hmm. everyone's three main animals, but I say horses, but actually now I say that, it's really all of them. There's always problems that I see in the, the neck area, sort of that base of the, the skull down the neck into the shoulder and then back into the lower lumbar and the hips. Um, is, this, is this something that you see? Uh, is there like a predominant area that you see with your, with your work? So the, the atlas, the first bone of the spine, is an area that I find is often restricted, locked up, not moving in a healthy way, painful. And that's in dogs, cats, and I haven't done a lot of hands-on work with horses because I haven't really played with horses much in the last 15 years or so. And the neck is another area that often has pain in animals and the lower back is another area, the sacrum. But it varies from animal to animal depending on what's happened. With horses, especially the way we break horses in to be tied up, I'm not at all surprised that a lot of them have a lot of neck issues because... The usual way of tying a horse up is just to tie them up and let them pull back until they stop. And that mm. puts tremendous pressure on the structures and tissues of the spine and the neck. And, um, you know, then you have people who might not have kind, soft hands with bits and tie downs and tongue ties and, and tying their head right down to get them into that um, shape that they want to have them for dressage yes. and all that sort of thing. You know, personally, I reckon spurs should be banned completely. And I reckon, too, that we should ride with something that is a, a concept that I've just been thinking of recently is I reckon we should be riding with breakaway brains that break out of the bit, break out off the, the um, bit with too much pressure. Now, you could have a second right. piece of rope so that you don't lose, you know, they don't just fall to the ground, right? But yeah. I would love to see all competition to be spur free and to have breakaway reins. And if your rein, if you use too much pressure and the rein goes back to the safety, you're out of, you're, you're disqualified. Now yes. that would, that would require um, a whole different approach of training. It wouldn't be a lot. And, you know, it wouldn't be easier. It'd be a lot more challenging because people would have to learn how to communicate with the horses in a really sensitive way that the horses understand and the horses wanted to participate in rather than being forced to by um, using aversive stimuli like spurs. And, I mean, I grew up using spurs. I was so proud when I got my first set of spurs when I was a kid and, and now I, I can see how... You know, it would be really beautiful to, to see humans not having to use any of those sort of aids that cause pain and discomfort at all, you know. And likewise, whips with, with racehorses, I think they should be completely banned. And I think if you can't run a horse in just a normal, simple, fairly good-sized snaffle bit, then you shouldn't be running the horse at all, is my judgment on that one. Yes, yeah. What about actually riding horses? You know that you've got your, your, ver your vertical and your horizontal. How does that actually, I know we've been riding horses for centuries, but um, the actual riding of a horse, is that a good thing to do for a, their skeletal system? I think if you've got the right saddle and you've got the right weight of person for the size of horse, yeah. And if you've got a person who knows how to sit in the middle of the horse and, and balance with the horse and work with the horse, I think it's okay to ride them. Yes. That being said, I think it would be, be really great if everyone knew how to assess for pain and relieve pain with body work so that 
a lot of behavior in horses that is undesirable comes directly from pain, right? And a lot of people will just ride through it and the horse then may warm up and seem to be okay, but they're not really okay underneath it all. So, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of beauty in that partnership of riding and connection as well. And I, I, I would hate to see humanity and the equine kingdom lose that connection through not having any riding at all. So I, I'm not into the whole really extremist animal justice thing, which thinks that we shouldn't have even pets at all. You know, we shouldn't have any animals at all. And I think if that came to pass, a lot of animals would just disappear from the planet. Yeah. Before we finish off, thank you um, for such great information. What is the highlight? What's your life's highlight so far in the vet world? What do you love? Look, I, I think what I really love in in my work is there's a couple of things. One is when I have people who come in with a dog that's just out of control, jumping all over people, mouthing people, got no respect for boundaries, got no no idea of what the humans want and showing them how to communicate with their animal in a healthy, boundaried and still kind way, but, you know, even in, in an intimate partnership with another human being, you have times that, like, just, I just need my space, right? Just out of my space for a little while. I just need my space. And you need to have that with your dogs too. You need to be able to say to your dog, well, just stay out of my space for a little while. Yeah. You need the dog to respect that. Mm -hmm. to the point of where they'll just go and sit on their bed and maybe come back a little bit later. You know, my little dog Mitzi is a terrible, terrible space invader. He's shocking. <laughs> and um, he's really good most of the time, but I, I entered into a new relationship in the last six months or so. And at one time when my partner was here visiting for the weekend, well, Mitzi was taking advantage of her in the most undignified and awful way that you can imagine. <laughs> Now, then he started ignoring me. So Mitzi, after he, he just didn't respond to my, my communication a few times, I sent him up the other end of the house and shut the door. Time out, dude. Time out. I'm just not going to put up with this behaviour. And after about 15 <laughs> minutes, I called him back in and we, we were sitting on a big beanbaggy thing and he got up there beside me, but I really was very clear that no you need to just stay in your space on this thing and not be pushing your nose on my leg and not coming in I had to spend about 15 minutes really focusing on that really reinforcing that reinforcing it reinforcing it and he finally gave in and now he's back to normal good behavior again so he'd had some wins and he thought that he could um, do whatever the hell he wanted but we <laughs> had to have a little conversation about that so you know I've had a few people in the last few weeks that have come in with dogs that are just really high drive, highly intelligent and pretty much in charge of the whole world and their humans haven't got the, the knowledge, the determination, the will to, to be more determined than their dogs. And mm -hmm. I can often in half an hour I totally turn things around and help these people start to see how they can live with their dog in a happy way so that you're having a, a, a balanced relationship rather than the dog being a screaming pain in the backside. And the other thing that I really enjoy is the, is the body work and, you know, seeing animals um, just come out of themselves. And, you know, I always think of Benny, who's a greyhound I saw years ago that after doing a series of body work treatments with him, he suddenly started playing with toys for the first time in his life. Right. Suddenly stopped being lying on his bed all day and not wanting to have anything to do with anyone and seeking a whole lot of attention all the time. Yes. So that that's probably the other ongoing highlights of my veterinary work, I think. And, yeah. and of course, teaching heaps of people how to do this for their own animals and hearing their stories. Yes. And the more we get out, around across the globe, because on your website you've got um, practitioner lists, don't you, across... Yeah different countries and people can jump on there and find out, do I have one in my area and, and that sort of thing, can't they? 
Yeah, and you know, we have um, we have free master classes where you can learn about silent pain, and I go right into detail about um, where silent pain lives in the body and why it's hard to see, and and why your dog can play with their ball is like a mad thing, even when they have a whole lot of pain and show no signs. We go into a whole lot of depth with that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, just one last question, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Someone's just got a new animal, could be a guinea pig, mm -hmm. could be a cat or dog or whatever, a new animal, whether it's a, and this is probably a different answer for each one, it may be a baby puppy kitten or it mm -hmm. might be a, from a rescue centre or it might be just an old animal from someone mm -hmm. that, they, that they have brought into their home. But as a pet parent, what would you suggest for someone to to do for that would be just a great thing for their animal? I would say the most important thing is to be really present, something that a lot of humans are not very good at. So, you know, to, to put right. your goddamn phone away, to turn your TV off and just spend time with the animal while bringing all your awareness into your physical body and just, you know, a lot of people sort of disappear into the ethers to escape stress, right? Mm -hmm. But I think presence in a word is the one thing that animals respond to more deeply than anything else. And humans too, right? You know that if you are in a room and there's someone that's really present, it's magnetically attractive. And not only is it magnetically attractive, it's soothing and calming to everyone that interacts with them. That's great advice um, because there's something that, that I've said before is that, you know, you can love your animals to bits, but it doesn't mean you give them the best care and it doesn't mean you observe them or be present with them. And I love that. Just be present um, yeah. and kind. Uh, Dr. Edward, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And, you know, talking to a vet, there's so many different topics that you could just go from there to there to there. And uh, perhaps one day we can have you back on so we can, you know, chat about a few different areas as well. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. And for everybody else out there, I will uh, share with you all of Dr. Edwards' uh, websites and information. And for everybody else, stick around because we've got the chat box coming up right after this short break. <music> box is the segment where I get to have a chat with some of our viewers animals. Now it's not a verbal conversation like I'd ordinarily have with someone. It's a conversation using the language of animals where we transfer images, words and feelings from one to the other. I can smell on behalf of an animal. I can taste what they taste, hear what they hear. I can feel in their body what they feel. And you can gather a lot of information communicating this way from behavioral issues to emotional and mental health issues. I can taste their food and I can feel in their body where they're unwell or where they're injured. This is often referred to as animal communication. Right now, we have some animals waiting for us in the chat box. Let's go see who they are and what they've got to say to us today. box tonight everybody we have another viewer question which I'm thoroughly enjoying I have to say learning so much from our wild animals so no domestic animals tonight you connect exactly the same way and you can communicate just as easily with wild animals as you can for domestic so the question was about the whale song and what it is and what it means are they communicating with each other or what is that noise that the whales make now, I was particularly drawn to the humpback whale tonight for many things, and it went a little bit off the whale song, so we have a couple of little areas that we want to cover with them. 
When I first connect with the whales, I'm shown through a physical sensation, this deep resonant vibration through my head. And it feels like it's coming from my throat. It's very deep. And it comes from my head, through my body, through my organs, right down to the tips of my whale-like tail. And then it moves outwards, like it forms this energy field out and beyond around the whale. They have huge energy fields. And what I see with that is it helps them know where each other is in the ocean so they don't run into each other. They know when they're crossing paths that they don't hit each other. So this deep resonant sound that is coming from the whales feels more a statement of information, if you like, letting the other whales know that they're there as opposed to having a chat between each other. This sound I see keeping the energy clear through the body and allowing the body to heal if it needs to, keeping all the organs functioning and the body maintaining itself. It's very self-soothing. It feels very peaceful and restful. And I feel quite drowsy, almost asleep, but more like I'm in that twilight sleep than a full dead sleep. From here, they wanted to talk to me about how the ship propellers make them feel in the ocean, which was quite interesting, actually. I wasn't really anticipating that, but I feel a lot of fear around that. This sound is artificial to them. It is not a natural sound from another animal or another whale in the ocean. And it seems to distort their inner GPS to help them know where they are and where they're going. These sounds pulsate from far, far, far away in the ocean, and it feels very confusing for them. These communications never seem to run in a straight line uh, because now I'm coming back to the higher pitch sounds, which come from the air sacs around the blowhole. This feels more intimate, like they're talking to their calves and their whale relatives. This feels less a conversation like we would have as humans and more a connection and a sense of knowing from one to the other. From here, I'm taken underwater. So I've got my lungs full of air and now I'm swimming deep down into the ocean. There's a lot of internal pressure here and I feel this um, peristalsis type internal muscular movement that's going on like a pump. And without being all scientific, because I'm not a scientist, that has something to do with uh, feeding the oxygen through the body while they're underwater. It actually reminds me of a strong reverse abdominal breathing, which is a type of breathing I was taught by one of my medical Qigong teachers many years ago. This internal pressure really feeds and nourishes and massages the organs in the whale's body. And now not such a pretty view, I'm taken inside a whale's stomach that is full of fishing nets, plastic bags, shoes, rubbish, plastic water bottles, and I feel like my stomach is partially contracted the whole time. It is trying to digest something that it can't digest. I have this constant sensation of warmth, not in a good way, around my stomach. I feel like this uh, leaking tap in the back of my throat, this constant drip, 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 and this persistent release of acid trying to break down something that it can't break down. It's like this peristaltic wave, this muscular wave that moves food from one area to the next is on all of the time, but it's not able to move the non-food through the system. How traumatic is that for a whale or a dolphin or a turtle or for any of these animals that are filling themselves up with the rubbish in the ocean? Their digestive system is on all of the time even though they don't actually have food to digest. They've just got all this rubbish in there. Now I'm showing that the ramifications of ingesting plastic and rubbish are things like overheating internally, ulceration, internal bleeding long-term, bowel obstruction, and not only that, it makes them heavier. Not necessarily heavier because of the weight of the plastic and the rubbish that are in them, but they've lost their ability to generate power, so it's more difficult for them to swim, and they feel heavier in the ocean. Everything requires a whole lot more effort. Does it kill them? Ultimately, I think it does, yes. And what I've learned from previous conversations with animals is that it's not my generation or the generation below that is going to help make changes to the environment for the animals, for the planet. It is the kids of today. It is the five-year-olds and maybe the teenagers can really start to drive some of this change. So I wanted to ask the Whale Collective, 
What would you like from the kids of today? What they want is for the oceans to be cleaned up of plastics, of fishing nets, of rubbish, of water bottles, of all of the junk that's out there floating around the ocean. But not just that, it's also the oil and the fuels that are floating around the ocean as well. The temperature of the ocean is affecting them also, but not as much as the rubbish at the moment. They are struggling to regulate their body temperature. Their blubber or fat levels are changing to try and help accommodate this change of temperature, but that also affects their buoyancy. So kids, if you're watching this, I feel like you are going to be our change makers for our planet and our environment. So we'll keep being a little bit noisy, but I think you're going to be the ones that really start to make some inroads, which that's exciting because we can reverse a lot of these things that we're creating or we have created. That's the end of our viewer question. I'm not sure if it entirely got answered, but you know, our whales had their own agenda today and that's okay. If you have a question for our animals, domestic or wild, it doesn't matter, Send it in and let's see if we can get it on the show. We have our last episode for the season coming up in two weeks, so be sure to look out for that. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be back in just a moment. Make your day richer with The Richard Wilmore Show. Meet amazing musicians, talented actors, brilliant authors, hilarious comedians, and the most creative people in entertainment. Download the KP Media TV app to watch on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. That's the end of our show, everyone. Thank you again for joining me. And a big thank you to Dr. Edward for sharing his knowledge with us tonight. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow the pages, share them around. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'm Romy Bueller. I will see you back here again soon.